it's such a pleasure to be here. And I'd like to begin by telling you a little story, another one. Uh, uh, and this story is about, well, I think all of us love to watch other people, right? To, to some greater or lesser extent. And I love people watching. And so I have to tell you about this one guy who was one of the most interesting people I've ever watched. And this was when I was working down in Antarctica at McMurdo Station. And this guy's name was Neil. And Neil was this thin, wispy little guy with kind of a high-pitched voice. And he had a big head, so he looked like this sort of upside down exclamation point. And he, what Neil used to like to do is he liked to pick up the phone and answer it with a perfect imitation of the six foot eight gorilla of a station manager, Art Brown. So one day, phone rings. Neil picks it up, as usual. Hello, this is Art Brown speaking. And it was Art Brown on the other end of the line. <laughs> so Art says, who the heck is this? Or more unprintable words to that effect. And Neil says, why, Art, this is you. I'm so glad you've finally gotten in touch with yourself. And so that's actually what we're going to do here today, is to help you to get more in touch with yourself and what you're doing when you're doing one of the most important things you can do as a human being, and that is to learn new things. Now, to start, I, I have to tell you a little bit about my background in growing up. I grew up moving all over the place. By the time I'd hit 10th grade, I'd lived in 10 different places. Now, moving around a lot like this has some benefits, but it also has some drawbacks or potential drawbacks. And one of the things for me was math is a very sequential topic, and if you miss it, Anywhere along the line, right, you, somebody's a little bit further ahead and you're at a, from a school where it was a little behind, all of a sudden you can actually fall off the bandwagon and then you've fallen off. It's hard to get back on. And that's what happened to me early on. I, I fell off the math bandwagon, just said, I can't do this, I hate it, I, I really want nothing to do with it at all. Science is the same way. and so. I basically flunked my way through elementary, middle, and high school math and science. And it's really funny thinking back on it now because I'm a professor of engineering. And I publish well in some of the top journals, so I, I do very well as an engineer. But one day, one of my students found out about my sordid past as a math flunky. And he asked me, he said, how'd you do it? How'd you change your brain? And I thought, you know, how did I do it? I mean, looking back on it, I was just this little kid, and I loved animals, and I liked fluffy, furry things. I liked to knit, and I, I loved language and studying language. And at that time, it wasn't, there weren't college loans that were relatively straightforward to get. And, and so, I, I really wanted to learn a language, and I couldn't afford to go to school, and so how could I study language if, you know, in that kind of situation? And there was one way I could do it. I could actually go and learn a language and get paid for it while I was doing it, and that was to join the Army. And so that's what I did. I joined the Army, and there you see me looking incredibly nervous, about to throw a, a hand grenade. And I did learn a language. I, I learned Russian, and I ended up working out on Russian trawlers, uh, Soviet trawlers up in the Bering Sea, and that's me standing on a bunch of fish there. Uh, I can still swear quite well in Russian, although the rest of the Russian's a little rusty. Uh, but I loved getting, having adventures and gaining new perspectives. And so I also ended up at the South Pole Station in Antarctica, and that's where I met my husband. So I always say, I had to go to the end of the earth to meet that man, and I did. So, so the, the thing is though, what, I, what, what was going on was I began to realize that, you know, I was always interested in these new perspectives, 
But they were always sort of perspectives that I was kind of comfortable with somehow. You know, and having adventures, that's sort of a comfortable thing. But I wasn't actually kind of stretching myself to really have a totally new perspective. I thought back on the engineers that I'd worked with, West Point engineers, who, who were in the military, and I realized that their problem-solving skills were, in many ways, exceptional. They could think in a way that I couldn't think. And I thought, you know, what if I could read these kinds of equations like they could read equations? What if I could, in some sense, learn the language that they were able to speak. Could I actually change my brain to learn in that way, to learn what these people knew? I, you know, when, whenever learning things and, and tackling tough problems, people always say, well, well, break it down into smaller parts that you know how to do. And so I wondered how that fits into the focus and diffuse mode, because that seems kind of like breaking a diffuse problem into a bunch of focus problems. It actually, what that really relates to is that idea of chunks. So remember that you've got four slots in working memory. The more you can understand one simple part of it, that, right, and make it into a chunk, and then another little aspect of it, make that into a chunk, and then another one, and then, so you're focusing to do that, and then in diffuse mode, you're reaching up above and making the connection randomly when you're sleeping, out for a walk, taking a shower, all these kinds of things. So, uh, so they all are related, uh, but actually that's great advice. If, if you try and learn it all at once, it's so overwhelming, it's like your little prefrontal cortex is scrambling madly, but it's overwhelmed. So you wanna just get a piece of it so you can draw that up as a ribbon. A chunk requires understanding. So when there is a chunk or there is a, that means that there was an experience of understanding that led to that? Not necessarily. You can learn a word in a language and you can not know what that word means. And you can learn a lot of words in a language but not know what that means. So, but if you do know what they mean, it actually can make it easier to remember that word and easier to chunk that word and easier to use those chunks to put together sentences. So, uh, so for the most part, we always want chunking to involve understanding as well. But technically, no, you don't have to have understanding. It's just the understanding helps to kind of knit things together uh, so that you can remember them more easily. For example, if I'm trying to learn the word duck, is pato in Spanish, um, okay, if I'm just going pato, I'm trying to remember that word, I don't have any understanding of what it means. It's kind of harder to remember. But if I know that pato means duck, I can say, what if I'm trying to remember it by having a little pato that my duck is floating in, and that can help serve as, a, that understanding helps serve as a bridge to get it into my mind. So that very, that's a really good question because people often think, oh, you build a chunk, it's automatic that you understand it. Not necessarily, uh, but it's a very good thing to have for the most part. So I thank you so very much for having me here. And Fantastic talk, great answers. Learning. Thank you so much, Barb. Thank you. Thank you.